Greetings, my fellow quarantinistas. Um, I'm Joshua Samuel Brown. I'm a travel writer by trade. Surprisingly not doing much traveling recently, so I'm going to be reading one of the stories from one of my books of short stories uh, here for people to enjoy at home in the comfort of your own quarantine. The story that I'm going to be reading is the first story in a book that I put out about four years ago called How Not to Avoid Jet Lag and Other Tales of Travel Madness. And um, the story is called My Parents Are Little People. And it is 100% true, uh, I promise you. And it's about uh, basically a day in the life of a travel writer. So um, we start here. My Parents Are Little People by Joshua Samuel Brown. And afterwards, if you stick around, there'll be a link to where you can get the book. And the book is illustrated by David Lee Ingersoll. Every story has its own illustration. But uh, we'll get to that at the end. My Parents Are Little People. <clears throat> Accommodation reviews are to a guidebook writer's job what rice is to a Chinese meal, utterly essential and usually uninteresting. Hostel reviews are fairly straightforward. The hostel owner views the guidebook writer as an ally, even when the last reviewer called the place a mildewing, flea-infested dump, which a wrecking ball could only improve. I've come across more than a few hostels proudly displaying a sticker reading, as seen in guidebook X, on their front door, despite the fact that Guidebook X had nothing flattering to say about their establishment. Mid-priced places, boutique hotels, and the like generally view placement in a guidebook as a way to stand out among the competition, making owners of such places fairly cooperative in the review process. But the five-star hotel is a different animal entirely. Management in the finer hotels generally assume their reputation makes the review process superfluous. This sort of thing is handled through the PR manager. Leave your business card and I'll see that it is passed forward. Which is fair enough. I guess raffles and their ilk aren't exactly hurting for business, and their clientele aren't likely to run in the same circles as your average Lonely Planet reader. Among a five-star manager's job is keeping out the riffraff, a category to which I clearly belong. Nonetheless, I have a job of my own. I began my rounds that day using my usual strategy for dealing with reticent hotel management. No longer a guidebook writer, today I'm Joe Q. Citizen looking to help some out-of-town friends book a future Singapore stay. With my digital recorder turned on inside the mobile phone holder resting on my shoulder, I take notes discreetly for later transcription. It's a workable solution, but by midday something feels wrong. It isn't that I'm lying. Well. Technically, I am, but all in the name of providing you, my reader, with an accurate review. But that I'm bored. And if I'm bored, well, what about you, dear reader? And what about the entertainment of the hotel staff? I push through the revolving door of the next hotel, an exclusive, double-towered place with an astronomical price tag, and make a beeline through luxury for the front desk. A lovely woman with the name tag Anne greets me with a smile. I'm here to help my parents book a room for their upcoming visit, I tell Anne, giving a vague date of sometime in the next few months before launching into the exciting tale of my parents' upcoming journey. In the autumn of their lives, my parents have decided to visit the Far East, where I've been working for several years. The trip is a big deal for them. It's their very first time outside of the United States. I guess I should tell you, Anne, my parents have special needs. Special needs? Are they handicapped? Anne's tone indicates that the establishment is both well-equipped and proud to be of service to such guests. My parents are little people. Anne is visibly perplexed. She hasn't heard the term before. Little people? Little people. My father stands about this high. I hold my palm level with my solar plexus. And my mother, I continue laughing breezily while raising my hand mid-rib cage. I guess you could say mom's the tall one. Midgets! Anne's eyes brighten with excitement. Oh no, I shake my head earnestly. We must never call them that. They are little people. Little people. Anne tries the phrase on for size. You can imagine how hard it is for them to travel, I continue. In America, they often get stared at. Strangers pick them up and hug them. We will not let that happen here. The kindness of Singaporeans is well known. 
That's just one of the reasons that they want to visit here. That, and of course, your famous cuisine. Anne, now an unwitting participant in my pointless deception, smiles at this unneeded bait. I think we can make their visit most memorable. Still smiling, Anne leads me to the mid-level elevators to begin our tour. The standard room boasts a king-size bed, plush carpeting, and a flat-screen television, perfectly acceptable for your average traveler. But I've suddenly decided that my little parents have deeper pockets and more discriminating tastes. What if they wanted something more... elegant? Ah! In that case, they'll want the clubhouse floor. As the elevator whisks us to the upper levels, Anne explains the amenities of the clubhouse floor. I repeat salient snippets thoughtfully into my right shoulder. Harbor room views, free breakfast, evening drinks. Each room of the clubhouse floor is done up in a combination of modern and British colonial era decor and comes equipped with a top of the line Italian espresso machine. The floor to ceiling windows offer unparalleled views of both city and harbor. My little parents will feel like royalty. Do your parents like to swim? Anne asks. Oh yes, but not if the water is too deep. Then they'll love our rooftop pool and jacuzzi. The rooftop view induces instant vertigo. I shudder at the thought of how my tiny parents will feel. As we ride the elevator back to the lobby, Anne gives me her card, her hand lingering warmly against mine for several seconds. When you are ready to make arrangements, call me personally. I can offer your parents a discount, should they stay the full week. Leaving the hotel, I feel an unexpected twinge of conscience when it hits me that the empathic and enthusiastic Anne will never hear back from me. How long will she wait for a reservation from my diminutive mother and father? Will their absence lead Anne to believe that the hotel, or possibly she herself, is somehow lacking? What if Anne comes to believe that she'd unknowingly caused offense, either to myself or to little people in general? Might this trigger in Anne a spiral of professional doubt? True, I'd done my job, getting all the information needed for a colorful, informative review. But at what cost? I decide on my next review to create a less sympathetic persona. I want there to be no regret when my fictitious family fails to materialize. Ten minutes later, I am standing at the front desk of another top Singaporean hotel. The concierge this time is a man, perhaps thirty and tall for a Singaporean. His name tag reads, Frank. May I help you, sir? Yeah, it's like this. I began, laying on a sour Texas drawl worthy of any redneck trucker or small town racist cop. I want Frank to catch the faint whiff of truck stop and chewing tobacco on my breath. My brother-in-law and his wife, that's my sister, they're, uh, they're thinking about taking a trip out here and I'm supposed to find them a suitable hotel. Very good, sir, Frank replies with professional courtesy and little warmth. And when will they be arriving? Well, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of, well, they haven't booked their ticket yet because uh, they need to ensure transport. They're what you'd call special needs people. Special needs people? They are handicapped? Not as such. They're, they're big people. Frank appears perplexed. I, I am not sure I... Look, they're just goddamn fat, okay? They must weigh 800 pounds combined. I'm not sure what that is in kilograms. That's what y'all use, right? Shifting my weight leg to leg, I emote a mildly pained expression to drive home my shame and irritation at the situation. How do they... Fishing for words, Frank seems to share my embarrassment. Move around, real slow and not too far. They're gonna have to get some sort of special arrangement for the plane over here. I don't even wanna ask how that'll work, but Edna, that's my sister Edna, she says she's got a travel agent who works with people like them. Bob, well, he isn't too happy about the whole idea. Bob is Edna's husband. He's a nice fella, but god-awful fat. So, you would like to see if a room would be suitable for your family? 
Frank's tone is distinctly less enthusiastic than Anne's had been. There will be no disappointment, no lingering professional doubt when my morbidly obese family fails to arrive. Damned if I'm letting them stay in my apartment, I mumble. It's a studio. Frank rings a bell, and a bellboy in a crisply pressed suit appears. The two exchange a few quick words in the Hokkien dialect. The bellboy will show you a few rooms that might be suitable. Frank seems happy to be returning to other duties. We ride the elevator in silence, and I suspect strongly the bellboy has been instructed to get the room showing over with quickly. Y'all got a freight elevator in this hotel? Yes, sir. It is in the back. Bob and Edna come here. You'll need it, I tell you what. Very good, sir. The bellboy leads me to a moderately priced standard with two double beds on the 11th floor. Nice view, comfortable furniture, full-size flat-screen TV, I say out loud, taking notes. Bob sure does like to watch his TV. You got anything with one big king-size bed? That would be a deluxe. I will show you that next. You do that. No way you'll get either of them into these petite bunks. The deluxe room proves larger and more suitably furnished for a couple of Bob and Edna's imaginary girth. The extra-large king-size bed is an especially appropriate touch. I comment on the deluxe room's separate bathtub and stand-up shower. Either of them get into this bathtub, you'll need a crane to hoist them out. You'd be better off just bringing in someone in here to hose him down once a day. Like circus elephants, sir? I fear the bellboy may be on to me. It's time to bring my research to a close. On the elevator ride down, the bellboy goes through the list of eating options. In addition to having two on-site restaurants, we also offer a free in-room continental breakfast. Oh, that's real nice. They like to eat in bed. As I collect a business card and rate sheet at the front desk, Frank flashes a business-like smile, terse and silent. I am certain my fat family's failure to appear will not be mourned. Basking in the warmth of my own professionalism, I leave the air-conditioned lobby and hit the muggy streets of Singapore, contemplating the shape my next fictitious relation might take. My albino aunt has long pined to visit the Far East, and my uncle with Tourette's syndrome has yet to try durian. With so many imaginary relatives, the possibilities are endless. Anyway, uh, that was My Parents Are Little People. That is the first of 19 stories in How Not to Avoid Jet Lag and Other Tales of Travel Madness. Uh, all stories are illustrated by famed comic book illustrator David Lee Ingersoll. And I'm going to put a link either down below or after this, one or the other. I'll figure that out. But I'm going to put a link so that you can go and you can buy the book either at Amazon if you like. And I think it's $3.99, uh, available on ebook, of course. Uh, or you can also go to Smashwords and name your own price for it. So again, thanks. I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll probably be back in a couple of days to read you another story. And uh, stay safe. Excellent, Tamer, love. Nice.